Welcome to 1991 Movie Rewind, a podcast where we watch and review every movie released in 1991, from the all-time greatest classics to the critically panned and everything in between. We will rediscover forgotten fan favorites and uncover hidden gems as we explore the depths of direct-to-video. Join us in our celebration of the fun, unique, and diverse films of this highly underrated year. This week, we watched A Rage in Harlem. Rage in Harlem starts its story in Mississippi, where a recent gold mine robbery turns into a bloody shootout. Imabel, played by Robin Givens, escapes with the trunk of gold, leaving her boyfriend and his gang behind. Hiding in Harlem, she finds a patsy in the form of God-fearing Undertaker Jackson, played by Forrest Whitaker, who she can use while looking for a buyer. As more people become aware of the gold, the more danger they both face, especially when her gangster boyfriend reaches New York. Based on the novel by Chester Himes, screenplay by John Tolls Bay and Bobby Crawford, directed by Bill Duke, and released on May 3rd, 1991. Have you seen A Rage in Harlem before? No, I haven't. I have not either. It, um... I kind of forgot that this movie existed, really. Uh, yeah, same. Yeah, it, like... I think it kind of gets lost in the... I don't know, just <laughs> the the breadth of movies released in 1991 perhaps and also just you have stuff like new jack city which kind of yeah it's... covers the same ground but more contemporary and more uh social commentary wise and that probably overshadows it a lot mm -hmm. and then you have uh, harlem nights i i remember seeing stuff about that and then i think just seeing harlem nights and then maybe this it... yeah i wonder you, if people you think thought it's it like the same thing yeah yeah, I wonder if people thought it was a sequel to that, but it's it's not. Um, it's actually something of a prequel to two other movies um, based off of Chester Hines' novels. Cotton Comes to Harlem, which was released in 1970, and then Come Back, Charleston Blue in 1972. Uh, those movies both take place in the 70s, and we did not watch those for this podcast. We typically try to watch the related movies, but we just didn't um, in, in this particular case. Uh, but we're not missing anything in terms of preceding story because this one takes place earlier um, and really the only through line between them is the characters of Gravedicker Jones and Coffin Ed Johnson who are the two cops mm -hmm. who are chasing after uh, Imabel Jackson and all the other people. In those two earlier movies those characters, Gravedicker is played by Raymond St. I'm sorry, uh, played by Godfrey Cambridge and then Raymond St. Jacques plays Coffin Ed Johnson in those. We have different actors in this one as well. Uh, so there's very loose relation. But yeah, no relation to Harlem Nights at all either, which is another movie I have not seen. I have not seen that either. I just know that one exists. Yeah, it looks like <laughs> it looks like it would take place around the same type of time period. Right. Maybe a little bit earlier even. And it has a similar title, so I wonder if it just this movie got lost in the mix. Even though it didn't do too bad. Yeah, it's in the top hundred. It's a budget of eight million dollars estimated. It grossed over ten, um, which put it at ninety three on the list of box office performances that we track. I don't know if it deserves to do a whole lot better. I don't know. I mean, it's it was fine. Yeah. It was decent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, I mean, it's not it's not memorable like a New Jack City. You know, it's not as impactful as something like Boys in the Hood. I think it's better than Bugsy. If oh we're talking yeah. About if we're talking movies. about gangster movies set in the similar time period. Yeah, Bugsy. I think was earlier probably. Yeah. I mean, and plus that's based on a real life story right <laughs> this is fictional yeah yeah it may not be in as strong of a directing job in this one compared to bugsy but in terms of story and keeping my attention and keeping me entertained this yeah one i mean this wins out by a long shot uh was more of a comedy yes like, was this meant i'm assuming it was meant to be that way 
Uh, yes. Um, I guess it depends. Like a on comedy who you drama. Ask. Yeah. So, from from what I understand, I'm I'm not a reader, but from what I understand, Chester Hines's novels are this mix of like action and comedy, and mm, you know, okay. they're meant to be funnier, and so they're trying to capture that tone, um, or at least the producers wanted to capture this to- tone. I guess there's dispute as to whether or not Bill Duke, the director, agreed. Mm. Because he was not wanting to play it off as like a straight up comedy, he wanted to make more of a traditional action film or mystery or whatever. And so the, I think the reason you're expressing confusion and the way like you know a lot of the tone doesn't quite land is because it it sounds like there may have been some infighting on set and that you know maybe some of the jokes that were originally in the script were cut out or, or you know who knows what or just not. Not everyone was on the same page as to what direction they wanted the movie to go in. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, it definitely has comedic elements to it. I think that's seen by having Gravedigger played by George Wallace here. Right. And we have other people who, you know, are known in the comedy space. Robin Gibbons was in Head of the Class. You know, that's like her really only major role up to this point. Yeah, Um, until Boomerang next year, which, I mean, that's another... Yeah, but this this skyrocketed her in terms yeah. of uh, box office marketability for a while, and so you have Forrest Whitaker had done everything, <laughs> Gregory Hines had done everything, and, and so you have a couple moments here and there to talk about some of the cast and crew as we go along because there are so many people in this cast that deserve some sort of recognition for what they've done. Uh, so Forrest Whitaker, we're talking about him right now, uh, Oscar winner for Last King of Scotland. He is the fourth and most recent African-American or black actor to have won that award. That was back in early 2000s. At least as of this recording, I'm assuming that Will Smith will be nominated and possibly win this year. Who knows? Emmy winner for Door to Door, nominated for Brick City, uh, and also a guest spot in ER. He is the Cannes Best Actor winner for Bird, where he played uh, Charlie Parker uh, in in that biopic. Um, NAACP Image nominee for Crying Game, Phenomenon, Phone Booth, Great Debaters, Southpaw, Godfather of Harlem, so there's another Harlem movie that I have not seen, (laughs) Um, and also most recently Jingle Jangle, that Christmas movie on Netflix, and he's also an image winner for Last King of Scotland and also The Butler, and we'll see him again in the 1991 movie Diary of a Hitman. So yeah, he's been in everything, including like Ghost Dog, which, you know, I got (laughs) when he, at the end when they're like jumping from roof to roof, I'm like, oh, Ghost Dog. Uh, Yeah, so the tone is not quite there. But there are, you know, comedic spots. I think probably the, one of the most effective ones is when they're talking about uh, the two pictures over his Forrest's bed, bed yeah. Jackson's, yeah, Jackson's bed. bed. Yeah, Jackson's bed, yeah. So you have Jesus and you have one of his mother, and three different times people ask, you know, like, who's on that picture? And the um, response is, oh, that's Jesus. And the other, and the other person will say, they're like, yeah, I know who Jesus, Jesus is. is, who's the is. other one? But, I and mean, then they the f- say it's their mother, and then they have a different response each time, which I, I think mean, is... yeah, that's like my favorite part in this whole movie. <laughs> yeah, so I don't want to give away the the punchlines, but there's a different response each and every time. Yeah, to, and, well, the that. first time, the first time they show this, all it just cuts to a scene with Jesus on the wall, and you hear Robin Givens, Imabel, going, "Who's that on the wall?" Mm-hmm. And Jackson is like, oh, that's Jesus. She's like, obviously, I know who Jesus is. And then they pan out. And it's another picture next to Jesus. And then he's like, oh, that's my mom. Yeah. So we don't know that (laughs) at first, when we first see that, until they do it two more times. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they show the picture above the bed, like, in long shots when they establish him as a character, but I don't remember fully if they say, you know, like, if he talks to the picture, like, no, he does. He does talk to the picture before he meets Robin Givens, because he's talking about, hey, mama, I saved these $1,500. You know, yeah, he's, but he's you don't know that mom. he's, t- yeah, but you don't know that it's his mom on his wall until he says that. Right, I thought but I'm he saying was, that's before he meets Robin Gibbons. Yeah, I know that, so, so but I thought he was just talking to her, is, like, my point. out of, you know, just talking. Like, as oh. if talking to himself or something. Oh, no, no, yeah. Anyway. Um, but yeah, those those are good jokes. There are some other jokes in there as well that, that land, and some that really do not land at all. 
there's a couple other people in the movie so that only appear for comic relief right so you have um jackson's working at a as an undertaker i'm not sure if he's actually i think he's the accountant of the undertaker yeah i think that's what his actual role is but anyway there's two people who, who work in the morgue there uh, Lewis and Smitty, played by Wendell Pierce, who everyone probably knows from like The Wire, and, uh, Selma, Jack Ryan, and, and whatnot, and T.K. Carter as, as Smitty, they are there just for comedy. Yeah, they're and... just kind of like these two guys just wanting to always get women. Yeah, they're trying to use their position to get women. Like you see Smitty at one point like picking up trying women. to cons- you yeah. know, console a, a widow. Like, right at her husband's funeral. She's, right. like, literally crying over her husband's dead body, and he's, like, trying to pick her up. Yeah. And, yeah, it, all of their interactions are all about sex and, and yeah. what they can do. And they're ribbing Jackson because he's, you know, this Cause he's... highly Christian, you know, never been with a woman because that would just, you know, that would dissuade him from his goals of whatever mm-hmm. it is he's trying to do with that fifteen hundred dollars which i don't think they talk about when he meets robin Givens's character Imabel, at the club and she hits on him you know they're flabbergasted and whatnot they're trying right to- i mean she's just in the beginning she's obviously just using him yeah, that's that's the whole point. You can see that he's trying to be as pure as possible. Right. Um, even though his first encounter with her is kind of inadvertently lecherous, I guess, because he spills water on her, and so like he grabs yeah, her, right on grabs her. her boob and like tries to wipe her off, and she's like, "Can you just not?" <laughs> basically. <laughs> and then yeah, she's like, "Okay, well, I need somewhere to hide because I don't have a hotel. I don't have any actual money because all I have is the gold, which I can't expose." Mm-hmm. And so I'm trying to find a place to stay. Okay, I'll use this guy who spilled this drink yeah, on this, me. and like, dorky guy who clearly, I could easily manipulate. Yeah, he'll do whatever I say. And stay with him until, you know, she sells her gold and gets all this money. Yeah. That, that's, that's the initial plan. Yeah. Boy. Okay, well, like, the thing that made me laugh, but I was like, why show this was when they do she seduces jackson like that basically that same night and she's like oh you've never been with a woman and their love scene makes me laugh it was long yeah they don't show like all they show is her butt but it's like him licking her butt and then her putting her entire tongue into his ear hole. I was right. like, why is this? Is this supposed to be arousing? I, yeah, I, I was laughing. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it made me think of like, not. of Naked Gun Two and a Half, you know, like with yeah. their lovemaking where it's like supposed to be funny. Yeah. I was like, is this supposed to be that way? Or is this supposed, like, is this the director's way of trying to make it look all seductive? <laughs> Right, and I, I don't know what the answer is. I would hope it's more comedic, but I don't, yeah, I don't know, but it was long. Yeah. And then they cut forward to like a week after, and that's when she's bringing the gold trunk into his place, which is also a little weird to me, because so she kept where, that... where was it for a oh, well, well, that's she... right, she kept it in storage after she got off the train or whatever, right? Well, she... Sort that of porter was like hitting on her. You know yeah, she saying? sort of rented a room for the night before she went to that club. Uh, and did she just leave it at that place? I don't. It know. was like a motel type of hostily situation. Well, I don't. I don't know if she was able to rent that room. That's why she had to shack up with Jackson. Yeah, I know that because uh, no, she, she... she basically got that room for free for the night because the woman who owned it or was working there was like, "You can have the room for the night." Yeah. Um... But it made it sound as if you're gonna have to find another place asap because I'm not gonna do this again. Right. So in terms of like the, for the for the week, I think she had that gold stored by the um like the porter at the train station. Okay, so she didn't even bring that 
I don't think she brought it with chest her of the gold hotel. with her to that yeah first place. Because remember, like he there's that scene of like her walking in front and she yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he had the the cart and yeah he's like yeah I can bring this all in by myself and I think that was some sort of storage compartment or something that she was able to use. Okay. So I, I don't really know how those things work. I don't know if that would still exist in current day, and maybe that's why we're confused. But anyway, uh, yeah, a week later, she finally brings the gold trunk into his place, and she basically just moves in with him, officially. But she starts to have visions right then already of him getting his throat cut. And we should say, this movie is kind of bloody at times. Uh, oh yeah, they show a lot of throat cutting. <laughs> Because I, I feel like cutting, there's a shootout I feel like that's her that boyfriend. Yeah, the the beginning part is like a whole shootout in Mississippi. So it's Slim, her boyfriend, and she's just like, "Please don't kill this guy." But he's like, "Oh, he's just like known for taking these people hostage and automatically killing them after he gets information out of them." That's what it looked like. Yeah, there's the whole big thing about Pop Goes the Weasel. Yeah, that's why that, I started that's looking his up... code word to say... I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> yeah, kill this guy. Pop Goes the Weasel. His time is done now. But yeah, they start off by cutting the ward off of this guy's nose, Lester. Which gives us the connection to Harlem because they talk about how Lester is working with this guy, Easy Money, who owns the Royale Club mm -hmm. in Harlem. Harlem yeah. Easy Money being played by Danny Glover. And so, yeah, they cut the ward off of his nose, and then they throw acid on him, but they don't really show the aftermath of that. But, you know, you do see people getting shot. And it's not the only time. You know, there's there's other times where, yeah, there's, there's some blood and gore in here. So it's interesting mix. It's not, like, over the top, though. No, it's not. But I will say it's probably more, again, to compare it to something like Bugsy... There's, you know, more bloodshed yeah, in this. Yeah, There's more bloodshed in this You don't this see than Bugsy... New Jack City, even, I would say. killing people. I don't remember. It was just him uh, getting pissed off. There's a little the bit time. of bloodiness at the beginning scene of Bugsy. Where and then they like just show him getting person. shot. But they don't they don't show, like, blood coming out of him. Right, they don't have, like, the, the squib effects. Yeah. But even, like, New Jack City, I think, has less blood. Oh, yeah, right. it was kind of the similar thing. It was like people getting shot at, but you don't see, you know, blood coming out. It's yeah. them, like, re reacting to it, and then them f slumping over. So it's kind of interesting that this is meant to be less serious, but it takes that part a little bit more seriously. Mm -hmm. it, I was honestly surprised that those other guys survived the shootout, because it seemed like they were completely surrounded. They had, like, you know, cops and then other white dudes coming to... Yeah, I thought I thought <laughs> and, everyone you know, they, died except for Imabel. Like she snuck out. And I don't know how she got the gold unless she immediately unless the, the trunk of gold was already in the car. Yeah, probably that she I escaped don't know. in. Yeah, I have no idea. Um, but I thought it was in the building with them. So, but yeah, all three of them survive. Well, I don't know if there's more than three of them, but three of them survive. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, you have Slim, you have uh, Jody, uh, who is played by the writer John Tolls Bay. This is his only feature as a writer. And then he's also going to be in the 1991 movies Out for Justice and also Shoot First, A Cop's Vengeance. Uh, but he's also been in movies like Cadence, Leap of Faith, Trespass, and Payback. Uh, and then Hank, who's a, the bigger, fatter thug. That's played by Ron Taylor. We'll see him a couple of times. He's in Rover, Dangerfield, and Fever. Um, so I won't talk about him too much other than to say that he was the voice of Bleeding Gums Murphy in uh, The Simpsons. Hmm. Which is interesting to me. He's also an actual blues musician. But he's since passed away. Um, so those are the two thugs. And you have Slim as the uh, the main bad guy here. Baja Jola. Uh, he's going to be in The Last Boy Scout and Christmas on Division Street for 1991. He's also been in The Serpent and the Rainbow, Mississippi Burning, Who's the Man, Rosewood and the Hurricane. And he is an effective villain. He's a, he's a good, tough guy, baddie type in this movie. So they arrive in Harlem, uh, first in form of, you know, these nightmares, and then when they're at church, she sees them, thinks it might be a vision, but they are there in Jackson's apartment, and uh, she basically has to try to pretend like 
she knew that they were alive the whole time. Yeah, I don't think she was she like, did. oh, I just made it up here before you and decided to do this first or get it over with. Um, like right away. Yeah, and, and so basically uh, talking about him. how she's trying to con Jackson to help get this gold out of there and and Slim is like, okay, that's that's great, but now we also have to con Jackson out of whatever money he has too. Yeah, and that's, there's like a scene, because you know how Jackson said he has, what, $1,500? $1,500, yep. And they go to this, I don't even know who it was, I forgot. They go to someone's apartment and they're trying to, quote, raise up their bills. Baking, like, baking the money. Baking the money to yeah, turn yeah. it to, like, 15000 Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's Hank and Jody pulling the scam. Okay. But I don't know what apartment they're in to pull the to scam. To do that. And then Slim comes in as a fake cop. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, that's that's part of a scam, and I don't. I'd love to know more about why that scam existed and why. I was trying Jackson to find out. I was like, work. was this a thing? Because yeah, is this how a legitimate you, thing? How do you? It, I, it, I mean, I was. I read a synopsis on the book, and it's like you know loosely based. Right. And, I mean, and re- pretty much everything was like plot wise kind of the same, but I think in the book Jackson and Imabel. Like, there's no Slim and his thugs. I think mm. Jackson and Imabel are already a couple, and there also isn't any gold. So yeah. it's like them together trying to raise, quote, that's, that's what I see in this synopsis, like raise up their bills from $10 bills to $100 bills by doing that baking the money. Right. And I was so... trying to find out, like... Was this a common thing back then? I couldn't really find... Because I, I was Googling, like, quote, raise up bills. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if it was something like, like Three Card Monty. Was it a common scam that people knew about that just is not continued throughout the yeah, years? Or what? I mean, because I was like, did that, that really work when you're baking the bills? Well, I mean, obviously not. <laughs> so it's, I know, it's, it's I was like, did people trick, actually do this? Yeah, like, why would anyone fall for it? Because yeah. it does sound like a magic trick. So it, it, we should explain what that means. Is So um, the idea is you take an actual, like, $10 bill, roll it up, put it into this device that's in an oven. Yeah. That's the baking. You turn it on, and then that hun- that uh, $10 bill is theoretically going to be turned into a $100 bill. So you're going to, you know, 10 times your money mm-hmm. instantly. In the meantime, that never actually gets to resolve. You have another person there who, like, vouches for the person who's baking the money to lend credibility to it. And then the stove will, like, explode or catch on fire because probably whatever is in that little tube that they put in the oven has some sort of, like, a flashbang device or something like that to, you know, cause the oven to, you know, cause the fire to happen. Yeah. And then the fake cop comes in and breaks down the whole thing and, you know, forces a bribe or whatever it is to to really get the money. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's like a two... Two or three prong setup, so that's what baking the money is. Is like actually literally baking money to in theory, in theory, like create ten, a larger, yeah, larger denomination than... bill, which is impossible. You know, yeah. it's clearly a magic trick, and it's weird that Jackson falls for, for it. it. Yeah, but it makes for an interesting sequence, and introduces you know Slim to Jackson, mm-hmm. um, and then where he also uh, says, "Stay away from this woman." Right, which, I mean, he stays away from her for, like, a day. Right, yeah, Jackson's, like, fully in love. Right. I mean, point. basically after the tongue goes in his ear, he's <laughs> yeah. like, I'm in love. It's right. <laughs> <laughs> the best wet, wet willy I've ever had. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, and then we haven't, I guess we can get to it, where Jackson has this brother that is the opposite of him. Like yeah, Goldie. they keep saying stepbrother, but it sounds like it's actually a half brother. Ha- in the book, it like they're twins. Okay. But so in not even this, a half brother. Yeah, they're and then you know he's like the good tw- twin and Goldie's the bad twin, but and you know in the movie Goldie yeah is they it seems as if they share that same mother that yeah is yeah. the picture on his wall because yeah, he's say always that like both... what. 
because they're he's always like what would mom think if yeah you never visited mom's grave yeah you weren't even at her funeral so yeah so clearly they share a mother right unless goldie called jackson's bio mom his mom as well i mean we don't know maybe and gold i mean we don't know their history it's just it's said that goldie is his stepbrother yeah who who they have not they have not spoken to in a long time and largely because jackson is you know a very religious person goldie is a con artist yeah by trade pretty much um played by gregory hines uh, i don't I, we mentioned him but not in conjunction with this character so gregory hines plays goldie um emmy nominated for bojangles uh tap dance in america and motown returns to the apollo and also something called i love liberty which i'm not very familiar with he has an image win for bojangles as well also nominated for the gregory hines show waiting to exhale tap and off limits uh, he's going to be in the 1991 movies Eve of Destruction and White Lie. Uh, but he's also been in a whole bunch of different stuff. History of the World Part 1 is where he got his start in terms of movies. Um, he took over for um, Richard Pryor. Uh, because Richard Pryor had that accident with the freebasing. Mm. You know, that injured him and, and mm-hmm. caught himself on fire or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so Gregory Hines filled in for him in that movie. Um, he was also in Muppets Take Manhattan, which is where I learned of him. <laughs> oh, I knew him from, like, White Knights. <laughs> <laughs> I remember him helping out Kermit in Muppets Take Manhattan. Uh, he was also in Cotton Club and Running Scared. Uh, and he also is a 1992 Tony winner uh, for Jelly's Last Jam. I really liked Goldie's character in here. Uh, I mean, yeah, because I liked I, the performances I and I liked I've the relationship s- between those two. I, I don't think I've ever seen Gregory Hines, like, in this type of role. Like he's you mean always... like a aggressor type of a role, you mean? Well, I guess he always like in other movies. I guess he always just plays like a serious guy, and this one was more comedy like. Yeah, I don't. Know. I mean, like I said, I learned of him from Muppets Take Manhattan, which was okay. more of a comedy, you know. So, and I know he does a lot of like I tap dance. He only does like children's programming in, too, and so you know, like he, serious roles. I think it's more the opposite of that for me. It's like I'm not used to him trying to play things more seriously and being like a thug type yeah he's always like the good guy or yeah something. he's al- he's almost always the good guy and here i mean he is a good guy even in like waiting to things. exhale he was like the good guy that came became like lovers with that one lady i forgot her name or yeah I, I, i'm not used to seeing him in the serious roles like right? someone so who's because they show the him roles. in this bed with like having an orgy or something he's got all this women in his right. bed like naked and then him dressing up as like a preacher stealing money from kids basically mm-hmm. like so doing all these things yeah i think he is a bad person i don't know if he lives in the brothel mm-hmm. or if he's just there a lot because yeah that's where his friends are or yeah also I was like, I guess. so is he just always yeah i was like where does he go because <laughs> he's always either like in the clubs that brothel place which i guess is connected with that club probably you connected with with easy money's club the yeah. royale i don't think so oh because no. it's like those women are always there i don't know if that oh, maybe was... yeah maybe they get farmed out to work the show yeah i don't they don't explain but that's I what i know. assumed yeah. but well i mean i think the royale is like where they had the undertaker's ball right Mm. isn't that what that is okay um so undertaker's ball is like where uh imabelle and jackson meet it's basically a yeah like a big party for undertakers in this yeah i thought that was like okay it makes for (laughs) For all these undertakers and yeah and at one point he sees goldie there he's like you're not an undertaker and he's like why are you here but that was like like, the only thing we didn't know about his relationship at that time yeah he was just like there because it's a club Right, yeah, Goldie's is there, there's to, women there to party with women. Yeah. yeah. And they have, like, Screaming Jay Hawkins perform. Right. Which, which is that was played pretty... by himself. Yeah, um, that, I mean, that was, like, a whole cool scene. That was really cool, because you get to see... Uh, it's a bad lip sync of I Put a Spell on You. Um, really bad lip sync of it. Uh, but, I like, mean, that's his fine theatrics because, were really yeah, cool. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You have, like, uh, you know, like, 
props, like a moving right. hand what, that what are on the piano, uh, and like, like he, he uses like flash does. paper and all this other stuff in there. And it's like a magic trick while he's singing and playing piano. Yeah. Like he's blowing fire and stuff. Yeah. So that was really cool that they focused a, a decent amount of attention on him. Uh, Screaming Jay Hawkins, by the way, has also acted in a couple other movies, Two Moon Junction and Mystery Train, most notably. Um, he's also rumored to have fathered up to 75 kids. Yeah, Did I read, you read that? Yeah, I read that. Crazy. I was going to talk about that, but I was like, eh. Because, yeah. and then, I mean, after his death, I just learned that maybe they identified at least 33 of his children. Okay. And they all had, like, a reunion. Huh. Like, after his death. I wonder what they called it. Not the Undertaker's ball. Like, they should have, like, come up with a, a name for it. The, the I put a spell on you ball. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the spell casters or something. But, yeah, I mean, you can see the stage presence even... I don't know how old he was at this time when this movie was made exactly, but uh, clearly... You know, I mean, he died. You're looking at like in the four decades after that song was recorded. He died in the year 2000, so and he was 70. So I mean, he was probably yeah, so it was like 50s. 60s. Yeah. Anyway, oh, yeah. It made for a fun scene there. Um, and yeah, we talked about Easy Money owning the Royale. Easy Money played by Danny Glover here, and he, he's. I don't know what he's doing in this movie. Like, he's he's not really all that menacing. Slim is much more menacing in terms of villains. Easy Money is more like, I'll do whatever I can to get my money, but he doesn't really factor into the plot other than... Well, that's not true. I mean, he's he factors into the plot, but he as a character doesn't have many scenes of importance. Mm. He's just there, and he whispers his lines. <laughs> um very soft-spoken person i'm not sure if that's because that's putting the easy into easy money or something and he has the little pomeranian yeah, dog that little he dog that he carries takes around. everywhere and um which i forgot her name uh yeah i didn't write it down either i mean he, he's basically just there to threaten a couple people here and there or also just to be in the room with the money yeah so uh, he didn't he wasn't, like, actively involved in trying to, to get, I get mean, stuff. People well, just came to him for things. Yeah, yeah, because uh, you see the scene where Imabel shows him the gold, and he tests the gold out, and he's like, yeah, that's real gold. And then I was like, okay, so... And then that was kind of it. Yeah, he wanted to get the rest of it, and then That's he when got this whole arrested. thing would slam. Yeah, oh, okay. Right, like the... Um, <clears throat> Gravedigger and Coffin Ed came in and arrested him for whatever reason. I don't remember at the time. And so, yeah, he had to get pulled away, and she didn't have a place to stay, and so that's why she went back downstairs and talked to Jackson and got with him, because she was just going to be with Easy Money. You know, she was just going to... She right. was going to be, like... Um, Taking advantage of him. Yes. But that all fell through, and she went to Jackson. Yeah, Emma Bell's character is a lot like... Um, Bugsy, Annette Benning's character. Right, like she's just. But I think better than oh. what Annette Benning's character got to do in, in Bugsy. Like Annette Benning got to do like the financial manipulation mm -hmm. side of things. But okay, but, yeah. Like, I mean, that... Robin Givens got to be a stronger person and had to have a little bit more independence in this. Yeah, because I think she. With the whole thing with Bugsy, I think they really had like this love-hate relationship and that turned into this tumultuous thing yeah but they didn't get to showcase her like sexuality right like annette way. benning using men to get money yeah they didn't it, they may climb the ranks they didn't like show that aspect to be her. like this like i guess to become like a mob boss because she was cons she was pretty famous yeah. for rising up the ranks we, yeah we didn't see her do that it was me it was mostly, like, their relationship with each other. Exactly. Yeah, it was and focused a lot more on Bugsy about, than it was Well, because the movie is called Bugsy. Not... I know. But, I mean, <laughs> you can have... You can have... You can have... Yeah, you, we can have, like, a little that... separate thing about how her character became who she is. Right. Um. Which, I mean, I agree. And there was, like, a... I know there was a movie all about her. Yeah, we talked about it on the episode. Right. I don't... 
Yeah, I don't remember what it was called right now, but we can go back to our own episode. <laughs> I just remember there was a movie all about her, and I was very cu- like very curious. curious to see that instead. Um, but yeah, Robin Givens gets to do more of that. Yeah, we get to see her, like, her being the boss. Yeah, she is more of the mob boss type of a character who will switch her attitude at, at a you know, split second notice to become more of like the submissive, seductress type of person if she needs to. Mm-hmm. Like, and then when she needs to be stronger and more domineering, then she is. And it leads a lot of mystery to her character where you really kind of don't fully know what she is going to do um, at any given moment. And there are quite a few points in this movie where it could end. I feel like there are like multiple endings in this movie. Right. And at each of those jumping off points, uh, Emma Bell is, is out of the picture. She is left for one reason or another, either because she's with Slim and we're not sure if that just means they're going to go off and do their own thing, or she's able to escape Slim and we don't know if that means that she's just going to, you know, leave with the gold and start a new life and she's gone forever, um, or what. Like, there's a few different moments like that and, you know, I really don't know what she's thinking most of the time. I don't know if she's actually in love with Jackson at the end of this, or if she's yeah, even didn't starting see, I to mean, form any sort of affection. You can tell for that he immediately falls in love with her, but she's kind of this person that's just like, I don't want to be in love with anyone. Because even right. with her boyfriend Slim, he's controlling to her, and she's kind of fearful of him. Like, yeah, she's, she's looking for an out with him. Yeah, she. I. She doesn't even want to be with him. And then, I don't know. It's like you don't see her actually falling in love with Jackson. No. Even though that's what it shows at the end. They do leave together. Yeah, but and even they then, I don't know if she's like really in love. I, or I she's think... just going to manipulate him again. And that's like another story. Because I know, doesn't this... I mean, I don't know the other movies... They don't have, no, they don't have the same characters. So, yeah, it won't follow Imabel and Jackson. He'll be following Grave Dicker and Coffin Ed, mm-hmm. the cops. Um, at the end of the movie, well, okay, before the end of the movie, I got the impression that Imabel just did not want Jackson to get hurt because of what she did. Right. I didn't get a so that was like her soft more, spot towards yeah, him because he was just a nice He was just always. Because he's basically an innocent bystander. Like, he's always just been this nice guy, and I kind of pulled him into this exactly. thing. But at the end, Jackson obviously goes through a pretty large character arc, and at the end, it seems like, I don't think that Emma Bell could really fully manipulate him, maybe, but, like, you mm-hmm. know, that last scene seems to indicate that, you know, he's much more willing to be in control of his own destiny. Mm. Um you know, he's just had a whole bunch of experiences, right? He's, you know, shot a gun. He's fought people. He's jumped across rooftops. Like he's lived a life. Yeah, he's lived a life like, of, like, you know, weeks. action and adventure know. and intrigue and And now he's, like, enamored and with and, that and wants to continue yeah. that, so he I just, think. I think he just has that confidence now. Mm-hmm. It's like, I can do this stuff. You know, I don't have to just sit scared my, my whole life. Um and that gets reflected in that last scene, I think. Um, which oddly ends, like, after the very last joke that they tell, like, it's, there's, like, a very brief freeze frame after it, right before the credits roll, which I thought was really strange after this movie, but, because that is a sitcom thing to do, and... Yeah. I don't know. <clears throat> well, I do want to talk about Big Kathy's character. Okay. Because I think that's interesting. I, I don't know if there's been a whole lot of that type of showing like a representation so okay big kathy's played by zake smoke i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing that right i apologize if i'm not tony award-winning actor for master harold back in 1982 um also been nominated a couple other times uh fled from south africa in the 1960s um and became an actor starting in 1967 with the comedians opposite of elizabeth taylor He's also been in The Serpent and the Rainbow, Outbreak, Waterworld, Vampire in Brooklyn. He also founded the Black Actors Theater in San Francisco with Danny Glover back in 1980. Um, And he'll be in a couple other 1991 movies, uh, Body Parts and The Doctor. He plays Big Kathy, who runs the brothel. He's 
Or and is also like the madam of that. A crossdresser, transvestite, possibly trans. I I I assume that he was just dressing up in drag and being the house mother. That's why it couldn't look like. Like like he but was trying he to got escape out. something and like he was yeah. hiding as a person in drag to try to escape prosecution. I think, and then, because then when the we get to the. Says. Yeah, I don't know any... I, it doesn't say anything about Big Kathy's character when I was, read the sy- synopsis in the book, so I don't mm. even know if this person is in the book. Okay. Or or not. But, yeah, I was just curious. Because then, you know, at the end, where, he, you know, he's participating with this in the shootout, but he's not at... I mean, he's known as Big Kathy, but he's dressed as a man. Yeah, yeah. Doing he's it. Driving them around and... and um quote-unquote male street clothes right like a normal suit and hat and whatnot and yeah the thugs recognize him as that person from from the club and and kill him after that i I think what struck me about this is that in a movie that does definitely have some comedic elements to it they don't treat that with any sort of comedic flavor like at all no they just they call her big big kathy but and it's then, just straight up accepted by everybody. Right. And Except then, for the bad guys, the thugs. Right. And, you know, but they still little... call her Big Kathy in and out of drag. Like, they. The correct pronouns is them. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. But I do know that it was really interesting to see a character like that not made to be a villain in right. some way because I mean, we... that's, that's what typically happens in these days like right if... we'll see and there's other movies there's in this other year movies, yeah. that sh- villainize like transgender people yeah and for a movie that takes place in 1956 to see that type of interaction with a character like that was really interesting to me right i think yeah big kathy was like Goldie's mother, in a sense, is basically the way he was trying to Right, and that's what made me think, did he also... I mean, we don't know anything about their upbringing, but we know that Jackson and Goldie are, quote, stepbrothers. But it seems as if Goldie was raised by Big Kathy in this brothel situation. Yeah, yeah, it seemed like, yeah, Big Kathy pretty much just took him in under his wing, most likely. Maybe after the death of Jackson's mom. Like, we don't even... Like, Jackson went to church, and then Goldie just went under the wing of Big Kathy. It could be. There, there's a lot of stories in the city that do not get to be right, told. Right, that's not told, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we haven't even talked about, like, Claudex and all that kind of stuff that happens in here either. And, you know, some of these other... Easy Money, again, is, is known mm. in the film world, but not to the audience world and stuff like that you know there's a couple different examples but yeah i I don't know there's there's more that we could possibly talk about like the stage show with the tongue puppet guy and stuff like that so you know we'll find a screenshot of that to plug Mm. in there um but i mean overall it's it's something of a disjointed movie but it's an entertaining one and it you know it bounces between comedy and action a lot We'll talk about Bill Duke as the director. Uh, he's also an actor. As a director, he's done stuff for Falcon Crest, Hill Street Blues, Knott's Landing, Miami Vice, so a lot of TV stuff. He also did Sister Act 2 uh, and The Killing Floor, where he has a, he was the winner of a special jury and nominated for the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance for The Killing Floor. As an actor, he's been in Commando. He was Mac in Predator, uh, No Man's Land. Uh, he's been in Black Lightning more recently, and, you know, a lot of shows he plays cops and detectives. Um, you've probably seen Bill Duke in something. Uh, the other writer that we haven't talked about, Bobby Crawford, he was a TV writer. He's done stuff for 227 and also that Nickelodeon show, My Brother and Me, which was kind of short-lived back in the late 90s, I think it was. We talked about Forrest Whitaker. Uh, Gregory Hines we talked about. Uh, Robin Givens, we talked about how she was in Head of the Class. Uh, she also has a Stinkers nomination. I think she's the only one on this cast list that has one of those. Um, for Head of State, the movie with Chris Rock, uh, where he plays the president. She was also in Boomerang, like we talked about, Blank Man. She, more recently, she's also been in Riverdale and Batwoman, so she's still very active. Yeah, and she's also in the Head of the Class reboot that's on Peacock. Mm. <laughs> that I think is just starting up as of this recording. Danny Glover, we talked about a, a brief 
bit. Uh, he's going to be in three more 1991 movies, so we can talk about him later. Um, Flight of the Intruder, Pure Luck, and Grand Canyon. Coffin Ed was played by Stack Pierce, Robert Stack Pierce. Uh, he was in a lot of these uh, exploitation movies from like the 70s, like Hammer and Nightcrawl Nurses, Cool Breeze, No Way Back, and Kill Point. Um, apparently he was also a pro ball player, pro baseball player with the, both the Cleveland Indians and the Milwaukee Braves. But I could not find any record of him actually playing in the major or minor leagues. But, so, maybe. Um, and then Smitty, we talked about Smitty, T.K. Carter. Uh, he was in The Thing as Nalls. He was in Space Jam. Um, I remember him from Good Morning Miss Bliss and Punky Brewster. Um, and he was also in Ski Patrol as mm. Iceman. That was another movie I watched a lot when I was a kid <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, so I wanted to give a shout out to Iceman. And then, um, you know, there's a couple other characters that we didn't really talk about that I won't even mention here. But yeah, there's there's a lot of... Yeah, we didn't get there's into a the lot of Claude cast in X here. character, which... Yeah, played by Willard E. Pugh. Uh, he was in Color Purple as Harpo and CB4 and Robocop 2. He'll be in a couple other 1991 movies as well. I think, if anything, I do want to mention Gus Parsons' uh, character, uh, played by Sam Art Williams. He was, I don't know, he was just like another potential buyer at some point in the film, another person who was aware of the gold um, I only want to mention him because he does not have another 1991 movie, uh, but he is important in terms of um, African American art because he's like writer producer for the Emmy nominated show Frank's Place, uh, Motown Returns to the Apollo. Uh, he's also worked on Fresh Prince of Bel Air, Hanging with Mr. Cooper and Martin um, as a writer producer, uh, and then also he's done the Broadway play Home, which he got a Tommy Tony nomination for writing that. Uh, and then this was his last acting role. So it seemed like they, they made a very conscious effort to bring people in, um, and there's a lot of prestige hiding behind the scenes of this movie. So do a deep dive in the credits and you'll see, um, you'll see what we're talking about. In terms of awards, the only thing that's really worth mentioning here is that it was a Cannes Film Festival Palme d'Or nominee which is the third out of 19 nominations that we've watched on so, this podcast. Like, of the three movies, I just, like, it's kind of... It's an know. odd choice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other two that we've watched are Europa and then also Barton Fink, which won the award. So this is the third of 19 of the Cannes Film Festival Palme d'Or nominees that we've watched so far. I also read that this received a five-minute standing ovation after it was shown at the Cannes Film Festival, which I, I thought think, was interesting. Yeah, I don't know how they judge those things and what that means, because it seems like every movie gets a standing ovation of some length. I don't want to minimize this movie. <laughs> right. but, but, it's like I how mean, many about, minutes like, oh, was uh, Europa yeah, exactly. like, Oh, and this one got Barton 30. Fink. This one got a 45-minute standing ovation. Like, okay. Like, at some point, I just want to get out of there like why yeah, i don't want to well, stand and clap because i mean the 20 minutes the creators just, just of the movie liked it more than like the 10 are the creators movie. of the movie there usually yes so then i understand clapping for that it's like when people clap the after thing. oh okay you know like five minutes for sure <laughs> but you know, like to say oh like well, I clapped two for this minutes one for five is minutes enough. so i like this one more so i'm gonna clap for 10 minutes Right. And then you have like this whole group mentality. Why not just behind it? clap Mm-mm. when you like it? <laughs> or just clap out of being kind. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I get that. I was like, is that a thing there? Like, this got five minutes versus like 10 minutes or two. Right. Or not even a clap. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this person like got one a single clap. boo in his movie <laughs> for a can. But it's on our list of 19 nominees, yeah. So we can move on to true crime and pop culture now. Yeah, I was trying to find if this was based off of anything besides, you know, the book. You know, if this is somewhat like if a true a real story. story. Yeah, I saw that Heinz had a quote in uh, somewhere that basically said that this is not really based off of even real Harlem. Yeah. But he just wanted to, like, basically take the white people out of it. And right. And to the black people. <laughs> you know, his stories were for the black people. hmm And, you know. That's why I was like, is this sort of... I know it's based off... Uh, I just wondered if 
Chester Himes based it off of anything that, you know, he witnessed or seen or whatever. Kind of like, you know how, like, New Jack City was just based off of, like, random crime elements. Yeah, just in general, the crack epidemic. Yeah, and then right. fused into one movie. And I'm mostly just going to get into TV because we have the TV guide. We do. This time. And um, one major thing is that we can scan this where tonight, which is May 3rd, 1991, a Friday night, it was the final two episodes of CBS's Dallas. It was the third 355th and 356th episodes of the second longest running TV series, second only to the show Gunsmoke. At that time. At that time. Yeah. We saw who really shot JR. I have no idea. I, I, I've never seen this show. <laughs> I know it was a big event in some households, not in ours at all. Yeah, I we mean, never watched a single in, episode. in the TV guide, it takes up, you know, two pages. One page says the, and the next page says end. Yeah. <laughs> so we can scan we'll that. We'll scan that in. We have it on the website. We can also scan, like, another thing. So, like, that was on besides going to this movie. And then, you know, it was a Friday night. It was the typical TGIF lineup. But before the Dallas part one and two, it was an episode of Guns of Paradise, which they show in the TV guide. And it's just like this ad that says, a shady lady catches Ethan's eye. (laughs) And then it has the special guest star of Nicolette Sheridan. So we can scan that, too. Is she the shady lady? I'm assuming. Oh, no. And then on Fox, this is another thing that we found out on in this TV guide. There was... Oh, no, not Fox. NBC was an episode of M- Unsolved Mysteries, but according to this TV guide, it was like a... I don't want to say a best of. Like a clip but show like a, It was like an amalgamation of just older episodes. Yeah. So I think it's like technically a new episode, but it's just segments from other episodes combined into this new Yeah, because they're, they're new, quote, new episodes are on Wednesdays. Yeah. They, I'm sure they just did not want to compete with Dallas by trying to have an actual additional new episode well, I so i've NBC seen this before like, so i don't know if this is like a regular thing because some, cause sometimes well, i maybe. see unsolved mysteries like on a friday night yeah, and if I, they don't have anything else for the schedule they're like okay throw let's another, just throw a bunch let's of get a best of together yeah so we weren't able to watch that episode because it was just a collection of random episodes <laughs> moving on to music I'm going to do the bottom five because the top five is kind of repetitive of, Similar to of other weeks. Yeah. And this is as of May 4th, 1991. I didn't have a chance to listen to some of these. Um, but number 100 is All True Man by Alexander O'Neill. I don't know. I should have listened to it. Yeah, none of those words sound Since familiar. I know. <laughs> Number 99 was Nightgown by Candyman. I know who Candyman is. The rapper, right? Yeah, but I don't know the song Nightgown unless yeah. I listen to it. And then I go, oh, okay. Or, yeah. oh, I don't know. 98 is One in a Million by Trickster, which which I think we've spoken about before it, or at least another song by trickster because i've seen them on be. this charts before and then 97 is gonna make you sweat by cc music factory i mean by this point it was like 82 weeks mm. on the charts so it's just like going down and number 83 is the star of spangled Banner banner by whitney houston okay but it had her other um like, number 85 was All the Man That I Need by Whitney Houston. And then number 26 was Miracle by Whitney Houston. So oh. she has, like, three hits on the top 100. Top Star Spangled Banner 
as of May, as of May 4th, 1991 was 83. So it's still on the charts. Yeah, we gotta put together a chart or something for the website at some point here. Yeah, for her <laughs> Star Spangled Banner yeah. watch. And then, okay, we can go back. So number 96 was Can I Call You My Girl by PC Quest. Oh, sounds like a good computer game, though. So on to rankings and ratings. Uh, where on your 1 to 5 star scale would you put a Rage in Harlem? Um, I'm gonna give this a 3. On my zero to four star scale, yeah, um, yeah, I'm kind of middle of the road on it. Um, I'm gonna say two and a half. It's it's above average. I did find it more enjoyable than Bugsy, but I think Bugsy was a better made film. New Jack City, I think, was uh, more effective as well in the you know same basic genre, I guess, of gangster movies. Um, so I'm gonna say two and a half. Uh, every movie is worth watching once. Would you watch it again? Um, sure. Yeah, well, I mean, I wouldn't... Wouldn't be my first choose. choice. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't choose it. But, I mean, if it was on TV, I would watch it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fun. Um, I mean, honestly, I'd much rather see some of the other stuff that I've talked about on this list, like Cotton Comes to Harlem or Come Back Charleston Blue or some oh, of the yeah, stuff the, that uh, well, the other Pierce movies was in, like that, Night Call Nurses and stuff. Like the two other movies besides this one like that would written by the same writer you know yeah, I, I, that where the movies are based upon I, I'm curious about that I'm really interested in that stuff and, and exploitation films in general are kind of a blind spot for me so I'd rather look at something else than this again but yeah I mean if it's on I would watch it um, and if you out there want to watch A Rage in Harlem as of this recording in January 2022 it's available on Prime Tubi, Pluto TV, Roku Channel, Digital Rental, VHS, DVD. As always, check your local listings. As for us, you can find us on all of your major podcasting platforms. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe, and tell your friends. It really does help us out a lot. You can email us at 1991movierewind at gmail.com. Of course, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd. Just search 1991movierewind or go to 1991movierewind.com for the full list of 800 movies along with show notes, Whitney Houston watches, and more. Next week, we'll be watching Daughters of the Dust. That's available on Tubi, Criterion Channel, Turner Classic Movies, Canopy, Digital Rental, VHS, DVD. We will see you then.